Welcome everyone to Already Cancelled. I am Peter, that is Tara, and we talk about TV shows here. The year is 2021, and the name of the show is Babylon 5. So, full spoilers for the episode, it is season 3, episode 8, it is called Messages from Earth. And yeah, this is a big one, this is uh, Earth's association with the shadows is brought to light, you know, it's there. And we also have a little bit more of Delenn and Sheridan romance blossoming, perhaps? Yes. I figured that'd make you happy. Yes, I love that they're always finding ways to, like, touch each other. Just a little bit. Just a little, little hand mm. on the back while they're walking, or a little hand on the shoulder while they're driving. A little bit of <laughs> a little pillow talk. Little, when they're sleeping little, in separate bunks. A little bit of pillow talk, yes. A little bit of pillow talk in this. Um, and, 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 you know, the, 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 some other subplot stuff with the Night Watch going on, but it felt like a big episode. Um, mm. This is the first of what looks to be three big episodes, and the next two, judging from the INDB's average ratings, are bigger than this one. <laughs> so we seem to be in a little nice stretch, starting with this one, which is exciting. Cool. Uh, so yeah, the, the the basic gist of this one, the main the main thing is that they establish at the start, you know, it reminds us of, of like Earth, you know, they've released information that there's been this footage of the the shadow ship, and we we we, we sort of predicted they were going to use that as sort of propaganda to sort of like do things, but we see actually it kind of playing out this episode where it's on the news, the others are kind of noticing this, we see Sheridan, uh, Vonova, they're all watching this. But the big thing that really shakes things up is that a woman comes aboard, which uh, Cole is protecting. Uh, she does get a little bit injured, but he, he does save her. And she's brought to her secret group. And there she drops some pretty big bombshells. Now, some of it's stuff that we already kind of know, right? But it's a big deal for the characters to learn it. And that is, of course, that Earth might, in fact, at least people on Earth might be working with the Shadows. That's the big thing. Mm-hmm. But we, we get this whole backstory of... One of these ships was actually found on Mars about seven years ago, and Garibaldi had like seen part of it or something. Like he, like it was him that kind of reached out and tried to find this woman, because he, he sort of like knew there was like mystery going on there. Uh, but he, uh, you know, they, they sit there, they listen to her. She talks about how they found this ship because you know that's kind of her job. She 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 dug up looking for artifacts that might be on Mars, like you know ancient aliens and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even mean to say the name of that show. It was just it was just the obvious thing. I mean, essentially, that's what the first ones are. They're ancient aliens, right? If you want to yep. boil it down to something. So, uh, but this ship was, like, left behind. It was derelict. But then another shadow ship, after they were mysteriously all told to back away, which implies that there was already someone high up on Earth who was at least a liaison to, to these beings, even at that time. And mm. this other shadow ship shows up, digs it out, and uh, this other ship, you know, rises up, and this woman witnesses a lot of this. Yes. Plus, it was buried there at least a thousand years ago, she said. So it's kind of like a War of the Worlds thing where they've been yeah. there for a long time. Which, in this, in this case, is not that surprising because we know that they're even older than that. Like these, these beings are, you know, way before our time. So, you know, millions and millions of years. So, mm-hmm. uh, if anything, a thousand is like nothing to them. Like, this, this, this was practically yeah, last also, week. It was also like 300 <laughs> something feet deep or whatever, so it mm. implies a little bit that it was buried there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe a line in wait. Uh, I wonder if. I mean, because maybe, maybe it's just an estimate. Maybe it's actually been there much longer. And. Like, this is from like, the first war with everyone mm-hmm. from, you know, eons ago. And that's why there's another one later on that we hear about in Ganymede is that these are all just things that were left behind way back when during the first war. But uh, some other details here that just before we get into kind of the, the reactions to this is that a per- one of the scientists uh, pulls a Prometheus and tries to touch it with his bare hands and it kills him immediately, which is why scientists, scientists. don't do that. <laughs> don't touch things so you don't know what they That's are. That's why you can't trust them. <laughs> it's, bad, it's bad news. It's bad news for everyone. Uh, so that was a neat little detail. Um, but their reactions to this, I thought, were was super interesting. Um, just the kind of the holy shit, like Psycho and Earth might be working with the shadows, and they want to take this new one on Ganymede back to Earth and study it and use it 
not to fight the shadows themselves, because that, that would maybe be your first instinct if you heard about this. You'd go, oh, they want to study it so they can fight back and use wet, you know, figure out, if not even use their own weapons against them, at least understand what their defenses mm-hmm. are, understand all that. No, it's, she makes it very clear. Like, they, they want to be able to use this and even sort of imply that they're looking for, like, enemies of the shadows. And that's something that uh, they already kind of say as well, is that when they're talking about the propaganda element of using the, the shadow footage, the ship is, you know, the no, no, they're looking for, they're trying to find out more than anything who else knows about them. That, that's one of their key goals. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so do we think then if this shadow ship was discovered by Earth seven years ago, then for the last, like, seven years, perhaps, and by the Psycor also, they were involved. Mm-hmm. Then for the last, like, seven years, then Earth force has maybe been manipulated by the shadows this whole time and that's why there's all this strife on mars and in psychor like everything's sort of just building up to <laughs> to this I, great I, war it stands to reason especially since you know i can't remember exactly when morden's like when you know when sheridan's wife ship thing happened with morden i don't know i can't remember exactly when the timeline that is i don't know if this was before seven years ago or after seven years ago but even mm-hmm. if it, even if it was before and morden wasn't like a liaison yet for the shadows it's not that like big of a leap to think that they maybe had someone before him, potentially. Yeah. Uh, Who might not be even be alive still. Yeah. Like his use was up, and then, um, you know, got the right people in power. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah especially since you know the the idea that you've got someone. I mean, sure, maybe they they seduced the, the current president Clark, who used to be the vice president. Like maybe they seduced him when he was already a vice president. But it's entirely possible that they were they planted him to rise to that position from before he was vice president that this could have been sure. an early kind of job if you will so all yeah. of that is super interesting and i think the big thing with this episode for me is all on the actual action pack we have to go and stop them from getting the ship sort of plot that we get to is just how much it feels like everything's coming to a head where sheridan is starting to have to make really tough choices about taking a stance against earth because not only has earth gov been kind of getting in the way he actively knows that like at least a big portion of it now is against everything and is the bad guys mm-hmm. and they can't trust them and it really felt like because even at the end of this episode when they kind of get away with everything they do which we'll get into he even says yeah we got away with it this time you know for now like but what about next time how much longer can we actually do this and especially when you mix that with the night watch stuff with uh you know them snooping around uh, yeah. like something like it does feel like we're, we're drawing to like a big paradigm shift in the show where the status quo of like who knows what publicly what do people know where do people stand it feels like a lot of things are about to change in the near future i think, I think my boy zach is gonna be our hero though i i really want mm. it i don't want him to like he knows he knows something's up he knows that what they're the the club that he's been in is not is up to no good and that they're pushing boundaries and people are starting to feel like gods when <laughs> and <laughs> are having too much power so, yeah, we got discount uh, uh, Caruso. <laughs> that is Vaughn something. He is a Star Trek alum. Oh, really? And not, yeah, not just like minor. Like he's pretty, he, he's a big deal. Even though I can't remember his last name. Uh, Spe- actually, speaking of a cast that I recognize, did, did you happen? So when they have their night watch meeting. Discount and- Caruso, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> when they have the night watch meeting uh, and Zach's kind of question because he's saying oh there's a list of names of you know infiltrated high up and you know he's talking about the perspective you know the conspiracy theory idea of like oh like all, all these things have been said about our president these are all you know libelous and blah 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 um, and he's saying that, oh we're going to go after these people if you see anything suspicious from other officers you know make sure we investigate it blah 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 and Zach of course is like this all sounds a bit harsh and you know, secret police and all the rest of it. He's, he's starting to really catch on, the poor boy. Uh, but the other security officer who chimes in and says, oh, what can we do to help? And has a couple of lines and even says, you know, the captain's missing. You know, so, you know putting a little bit of a spotlight on where Sheridan is. Uh, I recognize that actress. Um, mm-hmm. She's got much bigger roles recently because here she's credited as security person too. Because <laughs> I checked. Uh, so this actress is uh, Marin Dungy who was recently in Big Little Lies. She was like the detective on that show. Oh, um, okay. And she was in... 
um, Alias for some time. She was in King of Queens. So she's been on a, a bunch of different TV shows and things where I've definitely seen her in at least a couple of stuff uh, over the years. Um, Vaughn so. Armstrong is, I think he holds the record for the most amount of characters played on Star Trek. I think he beats um, uh, uh, Reanimator. I can't think of his name. Jeffrey Combs. Excuse Jeffrey me. Combs, yeah. God, I'm so, what is wrong with me? Um, yeah, I think, uh, he, he beats Jeffrey Combs for the most amount of characters he's played in Star Trek. He usually just plays like monster of the week guys for Deep Space Nine and, and most especially Voyager, but he is a regular character in Star Trek Enterprise. He plays Admiral Forrest, which is a big deal in the show. Did you also notice that he played a cowboy in the Philadelphia Experiment? Did you see that in his IMDb? No. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember him in that, do you? I mean, not that I do. Well, I only remember the sequel. Because <laughs> you've seen that, like, ten times. Well, I mean, it's Gary Graham's best role. <laughs> best role? That's a bit... I mean, that's the one that did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I mean, not, there he is. not a huge guest stars. This is not up to the caliber that we were getting consistently early last season, but certainly two names that are... Yes, yes, we see Garrett Graham in the background. Very good. Um, so <laughs> Is he coming back? Is Armstrong coming back? To this? I guess you don't have to look it up if it's a spoiler. Yeah, I won't look it up. I mean... But every time we are like, oh, cool, look at this person. It seems like they're going to be coming back. And then they never come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Chekhov's been back a few times. He's He's been recurring. Yeah, that's true. He's a big get. Um, so... Anyway, so yeah, the Nightwatch stuff. Um, Zach's questioning this a little bit. Um, he gets into a bit of a confrontation with uh, Discount Caruso about... How dare you? <laughs> He's still Discount Caruso, okay? I was expecting... I watched the, uh, the King of New York and Caruso's so good in that movie. I was expecting him to put on sunglasses and drop a pun at any time. Like, I was just waiting for it. <laughs> And I've never even seen an episode of CSI Miami. That's just one of those things that became such a meme that it extended yeah, beyond yeah. the show. It's it didn't matter if you'd never seen it. It's <laughs> oh, good stuff. Anyway, uh, so and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So wait, so you're saying that there is something going on because you know Garibaldi's not trusting you, and they've got some sort of group that they're they're doing stuff with. Um, and yeah, I, I I too am hoping that Zach's going to have a bit of a like a like a good guy turn no, no i mean he's coming off as pretty good the way he's sort of like questioning things right now but you're, mm -hmm. i'm kind of also hoping that yeah he's going to make this right choice and sort of give garibaldi a chance to let him be trusted and he'll you know and it'll be a good happy ending uh i really dug uh yeah, some of these scenes yeah i mean i i like the scenes too and i i really want he's such a likable character like i want Zach to be to be to be good and do the right thing even though he he is kept in the dark of what's really going on on the station and with the, everybody in the higher ups, like keeping secrets from him and not telling him what's going on, which is, you know, how people get into conspiracy theories because they see something untrustworthy and they don't, and because you're not honest and open with them, they just fill in the blanks with what other people are telling them. That's sort of what's mm -hmm. happening on the, the news media also in, on Babylon 5 because you know the way events go they're like filling in the blanks of what happened here yeah and I think one of the things I like about Zach is that he he never comes across as a dick like obviously when he, he, he made the choice to take this extra payday to wear this this you know uh, armband and become yeah, a, but it, 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 it always it came money yeah but he always came across as kind of like oh he's likable enough he's just he's just not the brightest but Mm -hmm. he seems like he is a good person so you kind of you kind of rooting for him to like you know in the same way that garibaldi has a bit of like a sort of like every man kind of schlubbiness to him right and that's part of his charm because it's like he's not just you know he's 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 not stallone right he's not some larger than life action hero who's he feel he comes across as kind of a likable normal guy who isn't perfect it's that bruce willis effect <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess sure uh, Bruce Willis is still he's not Stallone he's Bruce Willis in Die Hard yeah uh, yeah but Bruce Willis has a bit more star power though as far as you know yeah but there's a lot about there's a lot of Bruce Willis sure in in uh are you going Doyle. to call are you going to call him discount Bruce Willis is that, is that what well, you're going I, with this I think I did in season one you probably did <laughs> you, you've, you've, you've grown to love him so you can't do that anymore it's too disrespectful well I definitely like him more than Bruce Willis 
<laughs> I mean, Bruce Willis in his peak in like a like half a dozen movies, like he's great. Yeah. Like I mean, you know, Bruce Willis in real life and Bruce Willis's last twenty years of movies is you know a different story. But yeah, I think it ended at Six Sense. That was like his last good whoa, one. Whoa, 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 okay, whoa! I know, whoa. I know, Unbreakable, Unbreakable, Unbreakable whatever. is a goddamn masterpiece. I will not have this. I will not have this. This is this because I keep calling him Discount Caruso? Is this is this you getting back at me for that? Unbreakable's all right. I don't know who you are anymore. We don't have the same taste in every film. I know, but come on, <laughs> come on now. I'll watch it again one day. <laughs> That's the problem. You watched it in like two thousand two, and you, you remember. Actually, it being... I watched it before uh, uh, Glass. I think. Oh, did you? Okay. All right. Yeah, and it was all right. Okay. Fine. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I, you know, I, I like Zach stuff. Zach stuff. I, I think that actually, speaking of Garibaldi having good scenes with other people, I think one of the good things about when you have a show like this, where you have all these cast members and these characters who you kind of like, and you start to like certain connections, and we used to love obviously Londo with almost anyone was great. I think it's wonderful how much I am loving now uh, Garibaldi and Jacar. Like, there's this kind of weird. They budding have a real friendship growing. Yeah, it's so so obviously. Shakar's still in the, and he's actually still got quite a lot of time left because he mentions he's only two weeks down and he's got six mm-hmm. left but Garibaldi comes to visit him in, in his cell he only has one scene we get one scene in Shakar, but it's actually a really delightful scene where he's very upbeat and that kind of matches what we saw from him last time and he's writing down like basically all of his thoughts he's thinking about everything he says the silence has given him time to really look at himself and look at the mistakes that have been made and you know he's really having a go of it but there's some really nice banner between them. When Garibaldi comes in, he says, oh, by the way, there's a, a petition about your singing. And he's like, oh, which, which, which way is it? And, you know, Garibaldi, or sorry, Jakar getting into the spirit of what he's saying is like, oh, which way is it going? Like, he, he, he's sort of being playful about it. And Garibaldi says, well, given the sounds, everyone in the block thinks we're torturing. <laughs> and he kind of laughs at it. There's, like a, there's a nice little camaraderie building between them. Yeah, uh, Jakar has really, like, been enlightened these last couple of yeah. weeks. Yeah. Uh, some, some interesting stuff here, actually. Uh, about how there's no translated version of the entire book of uh, Jaquan because that's that would be sacrilege. Uh, I assume Garibaldi's like manually doing bits and pieces of it, and that's yeah, how he's, he's got Google Translate yeah. the whole time. Um, but like, so that was interesting to hear. Uh, and I, I think I don't know if we had, like maybe settled on either way, but someone in the comments did point out something interesting. I don't know if we fully understood is that Jaquan is the person who wrote the book and was like a you know. A, uh, the theologist, the th- philosopher, whatever the, the correct term would be, uh, Jaquan's not the name of like a god or anything like that. Uh, mm. So, because uh, uh, maybe there are a couple of times we've referred to Jaquan as his god, and that's not entirely accurate. Yeah, well, I called him the Narn Jesus. Or Narn Jesus, yeah. I don't think that's entirely accurate. He's more the the one who wrote the Bible. Okay, well, if that's, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and another interesting thing which they said in the comments which and I, I can't remember who wrote this so forgive me for maybe, not crediting maybe he's more of a of a Narn Muhammad then uh, for, forgive me for not remembering who, who said this but this was an interesting detail which uh, they said that they don't think it's ever outright stated in the show but it's kind of implied is that anyone who follows the readings of Jaquan has a name that begins with G like Jakar oh uh, I didn't know that yeah and that, that might you know so Natoth for example like uh, so do they adopt the name then, like, later on, or are they born into this? I wonder, I wonder if they can convert. Like, can they choose to change, you know, like like anyone can you know, when they're older? So, no, nah, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm this now. Like, I your name is Carr, and then once you understand religion, you can adopt the G. <laughs> the gangsta. <laughs> G- gangster. Gangster Carr, that's well, what I mean, that's what is, <laughs> G always stands for gangsta. <laughs> Okay. Gangsta car. <laughs> I don't know why, but for some reason, the idea of the brass eyes meaning gangsta cup is really funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, really good scene. I really liked this. Uh, it, yeah, it was, me too. And I did. I did think about like the the last time that. That Londo and um, and Garibaldi were together, and how sad that Londo was that their friendship had ended, and how they don't have 
the relationship they used to have anymore. But then it gives me like this nice warm feeling that that Londo has been put aside because of his decisions and Shakar who is <laughs> Shakar and, and Garibaldi are now like stepping into that role instead. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's an examination of like true colors coming through. And I, I mean, we've talked before about how, how much of that is circumstance and the opportunities given and how much Londo probably or clearly does like kind of regret some things, but is now locked into something. And, you know, we've talked about the fear of in the, the being trapped in the position he's now in and all those things. Uh, and, you know, could Jakar effectively be in just as bad a position if he was offered similar things? And that's a whole debate that we've had and we'll probably have again when it's relevant. But uh, yeah, like the idea that Jakar's like real colors have kind of come out and he does have this, this better side to him. And, uh, you know, it's not just about winning and getting revenge. It's about making sure that it's right for everyone. Kind yeah, of thing. Also, I mean, also just sprung to mind is that, you know, there's so much of Shaquan and the teachings of like of Shaquan and how since he's had this this revelation, he's been meditating and thinking about things that really matter in his cell. And uh, whereas like the gods that we know that Londo worship are like gods of of like passion and gluttony and <laughs> basically like all the sins yeah, so they probably wouldn't be the same right <laughs> they wouldn't be in the same situation if it were reversed if if londo casually mentions at some point that there's seven gods in centauri <laughs> religion then i'm going to give him a side eye <laughs> yeah it's like the god of food and the god of partying <laughs> and... <laughs> Pretty sure there was a sex god. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, they they have lots of sexual organs, from what we've learned. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. It's a big, big, big part well, there of was the that thing. golden statue where it was yeah. like the male and female genitalia on the same thing. So like that was a god. And fertility statues are, are a thing that that's obviously inspired by. I would say. Right. Yeah. It's just so. like you know, what's the difference between uh, like somebody who's in power, like a great um. Uh, like Christian or Catholic person who comes into power and uses the religion to persecute and instead of uh, like uh, like a Buddhist coming into power it doesn't really feel very threatening because the, what they worship is minimalism <laughs> like mm. meditation and things like that like that that kind of a difference so it wouldn't be the same exactly if the rules were reversed sure sure say. yeah um but I wonder if in that case Londo wouldn't turn to religion though. He would turn to something else. Like you know, he would turn to people around him perhaps. He would turn to you know Yeah, like, but I think that they're both spiritual. Is Londo that spiritual? I mean in the religion episode in season one, he seemed very proud of their gods. Well, he seemed into using it as an excuse to have a party and eat lots of food. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd call him spiritual. I made the bit you on that. <laughs> Um, I would, I think so. Like, I think he's still spiritual. Like, okay. he still, he still like uh, says thanks to the maker or something. I can't remember. Um, great maker, <laughs> or like, uh, he, he still, and, and he still has that side of him that believes in like the prophecies and and all that. So I think that's, I think he's still pretty spiritual. Okay. Anyway, right. this has kind of gone off the rails. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm just I'm wondering like how much of like some of the things he says is just like common, like, like the same way that we might say, "Oh God," but both of us are atheists. Yeah, like, I suppose. You know, and that's not even like you know borderline. That's just no, we're straight up atheists, and we <laughs> like we, but we still say things like that. Yeah, that's so. true. Yeah, yeah. I was very fortunate to not have religious parents, so like it's not even a thing for me. Yeah, no, nor, nor, nor did I really. Uh, yeah, I, I had kind of religious grandparents, but I mean, I never really. I had one aunt. She sent me books about like the true meaning of Christmas, but uh, I didn't know what it was still. Yeah, new video games. I just like the pictures of the camels and stuff. <laughs> new video games. That's that's the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> new video games. <laughs> Legos were a big thing for me. Let's get back to Sheridan. Let's get back to his decision making. This is the main plot of the episode. Sheridan, don't worry, I'm not forgetting. We'll get back to Cole and Ivanova later on. This is also some stuff to talk about there. Uh, uh, the other romance is blossoming in the Babylon 5 world. Uh, so, Sheridan, <laughs> upon hearing all of this, says, Look, I need some time to think about what my decision is. This is very dangerous. Uh, the woman, by the way, 
who she, who's expecting to be assassinated and is now at peace with that because she's finally told people all this this scary stuff uh mm-hmm. D- Delenn's like, no, 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 no. We've made arrangements for you to go to Mimbari space. We're going to protect you. You'll be fine. Uh, I don't know if that's we going to... We got a guy there. We, we have a guy. <laughs> we got a guy for that. Uh... <laughs> Sinclair. <laughs> True. Yeah, that's, I suppose, yeah. I was just in more <laughs> of a generic, you know, Italian mob. <laughs> I got a guy. <laughs> in New York. You need some? I got a guy. <laughs> uh, but... You know, he, he says, everyone leave. But then he says, no, no, you, Delenn. I need you for support. Aww. I need you to hold my hand whilst I I think about what I'm going to do. Uh, and we don't get to hear this conversation, though. We, we cut to him later, and he's standing in the observation deck, and he takes off his Earth Gov, or his Earth Force badge, and he's like... He was questioning... You know, he's, he really is like that scene like a cop movie where the cop looks at the badge and goes, I don't know if this is what I'm like fighting for it anymore i don't know if i'm on the same side as these people like the, the forces took her up corruption yeah like i don't know if i'm one of them anymore and they're like very ominously okay everything's set up should we tell the others now let's do it it's oh I was like, what's going to happen what are they doing uh basically they're taking the white star and the lad and sheridan are going to take the ship and just make sure no one can take that shadow ship that's been uncovered on ganymede and immediately, and this is where I was, I was, when I was earlier on when I was saying it feels like everything's coming to a head. And obviously they kind of get lucky this time and get out of it. But th- straight up, Garibaldi and Ivana are like, but you're going to like trigger Earth sensors because you're in range of, you know, Earth. You know, relatively speaking, I'm sure they've got, you know, sensors for all the whole solar system. And like, we'll have to fire on you. What are you going to do? Are you going to fire back? Like, w- mm-hmm. like w- are you going to let yourself be arrested? Like, what is the, the how does this play out? Now that you're te- technically doing like an operation, you're doing an act active mission that is going against Earth, and what happens when they come to to stop you and get in the way? And they kind of talk about it like this might be suicide. Like we'll, we'll come back if we can, but this this you know this this is the decision we're making. This needs to happen. They can't have this ship. Uh, so they really they sell it really well. They sell it as a big deal. So it feels like a really big yeah thing. Is there's a walking off room that I don't think we've seen so far. A mm. new set to really sell, like, how important this decision is. Yes. They're in a rounded room. Yes. Jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> they so, need a round table now for their for their meetings in this round room. Yes, yes. So, they go off to do that. Uh, Sheridan leaves all of these, like, you know, his ID badge, his, his techno thingamajig, everything so that they can kind of fake him being around. Although... Uh, discount caruso actually checked his like his entrance to his quarters and there was no activity in like three days and that's suspicious because he's not here obviously um and i'm like oh you sneaky little bastard <laughs> maybe he's got the flu <laughs> he's, he's been in the whole time yes he's sick yeah, he's quarantining he's quarantining yes uh uh didn't, didn't want the station to think he looked weak so he, he, he didn't admit it to anyone we know he's not that you know toxic and proud but like, as an excuse just to shop, you know, discount Caruso. Why do you keep calling him that? What if he comes back? <laughs> if he comes back, I'll learn a name and I'll, I'll upgrade him to, to recurring. But right now he's discount Caruso. Yeah, that I think said, he's though, just security officer one in this. That said, Bridge Boy has got a name and I don't care. <laughs> he's Bridge That's Boy. That's true. <laughs> so. He's Bridge Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, how long till I make a t-shirt with Bridger Boy on it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not buying it. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you should get a big print of it, though, and just have it on the wall behind you. Bridger Boy. <laughs> Trying to keep my place classy mm. and nerd-free, except for the... That oh, yeah. five Garrett but, Graham. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> G- Garrett Graham with his uh, Centauri hair isn't, isn't in the nerdy <laughs> side of things. I hide it when uh, when these reviews are done. He goes into a special drawer. <laughs> so they go off and fly to, uh, or I say fly, they jump, right? And it's, it's a long jump as well. It's like a, th- like a I think they say like a three day jump. Two, two days? Something like that, yeah. Because uh, there's a point where Sheridan's been sitting in the captain's seat and uh, Lanier's like, hey, it would probably be better 
you know, when we get there, if you've had some sleep, or, you know, if you've been rested, and he's like, all right. I just demonstrated how sleepy he was. Yes, F- fair point, fair point, Linear. So he goes off, and we we get a glimpse of uh, traditional uh, Mimbari beds. Because I, th- I think we've seen the bed that Delenn has in, on Babylon 5, so I assume that that's just is what it is because it's the Babylon 5 station, and they didn't install Mimbari-style beds. But we see all these beds that are Good. actually at like a what angle would you say that is like a ninety degree? No, More like forty five. Forty five, yeah. I'm I'm thinking like halfway between ninety, yeah, forty five. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. The, the point being is that it's not horizontal; it's diagonal. It's a diagonal bed, and I'm thinking, how is he going to sleep on that? He's going to just slide down. Like this is silly. Yeah. And of course, of course, he gets gets to one. He, he tries to lie down, and immediately he starts to slide down. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, this this does not seem very uh, usable. And then the camera pulls, and I love how it does this: is that it doesn't reveal it until it wants to. It pulls back, and we see the lens in the the bed next. So he picked the one next to the lens. So that's he made this choice. Mm-hmm. It's like a fifties couple, yes. in separate beds. <laughs> oh, is that a fifties couple, or is that just a couple on TV in the fifties? That's a haze code couple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that is a good distinction that you make. Uh, you know, they were all attling rabbits in the fifties. They just don't like to talk about it. It's just it's all hush hush. Yeah, that's the baby boomer era. Curtains were closed, yes, and you can't have babies without the booming. So, yeah. But anyway, so so the the line there, and it becomes this intimate kind of conversation where he's he's tired, but he can't sleep. There's a couple of jokes about how he's going to fall down. and Delenn, notably, you know, gets up on her side and she's got the, the, the hand. I'll catch you. Yes, I, I'll be awake <laughs> and I'll, I'll catch you if you fall. And she's been all... It's all very romantic. And then he tells a story about how the one thing he misses about Earth is the sound of rain on the roof. And you know what? I'm on his side. This is a very nice sound. I also enjoy falling asleep to the sound of rain. It's very nice. Mm-hmm. It's only beat by one other thing, which is being on a boat and gently rocking back and forth to sleep. I've never fallen asleep on a boat. Yeah, it's pretty wonderful. Although when you have to be awake, you're also sleepy all day because you're still being rocked like a baby. Do you know what's so funny is that for a split second, I was about to say, when were you sleeping on a boat? And then I went, oh, no. <laughs> just three years of my life. Yeah, just, I was like, oh, why were you on a boat? I was like, oh, boy. Uh, Tara was in the Navy. For anyone who's not heard this before, Tara was literally in the Navy. <laughs> anyway yeah. um, so so he's telling this story and he's talking about his exams and being up to like you know four or five in the morning and i'm like this is very sheridan you have never been more relatable to me than talking about a falling asleep to the sound of rain and staying up to stupid hours in the, the night <laughs> like this is like this is prime peter relation material right now <laughs> and he, he basically tells a story about how his dad when he realized he couldn't sleep and it wasn't raining his dad went outside, got the garden hose, and just sort of sprayed it up towards the roof so that it would sound like rain, hitting the hitting his, the side of his yeah. you know bedroom. It was because he had a like an exam or something the next yeah. day, so his dad knew he needed to sleep. Yeah, it wasn't just some random. It's not like his dad did this every night. It's like no. I mean, that would be commitment. <laughs> it would be commitment. Now this was like a special time because he, he really needed to get sleep for his test. Um, no, yeah, this was like a. We'll just put him in the car seat and drive around a while till he falls asleep. Uh, do, you, do you know what I like about this? Because obviously this scene ends with Delenn, like, you know, saying something and gets the ship to play sound, the sound of rain, you know, in like a thunderstorm. And all I could think was, is that he made it clear that that's what helps him sleep like five minutes ago. And you let him, you, you kept, you know, asking him and ma- you made him tell the full story before you finally revealed that you could do this. She wanted to... She wants to get to know him. She, yeah, she wanted the intimacy first. She didn't want to just go mm-hmm. straight to the, here's the payoff to this. It, it didn't feel like a like a writing trick either. It felt like a, a very po- pointed and intricate character choice that she wanted to make him tell the story first. And it's sweet. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's building their connection, their friendship, their camaraderie. And dare Only I say... she kissed him goodnight. Well, they did hold hands. She held his hands as he fell asleep. It's still, this is going too slow. Holding hands while falling asleep is very romantic. Come on. That's a, a romantic bit, yeah. moment, right? If, if if I was a married man and I found my wife had held someone's hand while falling asleep, I'd be pissed, right? This would be a step <laughs> above the foot massage in Pulp Fiction, okay? 
That's the level we're at here. This is an intimate moment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> Holding hands in general is definitely a, it's a bit of intimacy. Yeah, but while fa- most falling asleep, though, that's like a- an extra level. Because that's like when you're vulnerable, right? You're, you're letting mm-hmm. your guard down and being vulnerable to someone. So it's very intimate. They're still going too slow. I mean, I know there's a lot going on. <laughs> but like, but no. I have a feeling that Cole and Ivanova are going to get together, which I hate, so- for the record. Tara's just mad that there's not uh, one quarter Mimbari babies running around already because she's already half human. That's important to know. I'm just saying that, like, I'm invested. (laughs) How long are you going to make me wait for this? I already want it. I just don't want (sighs) to... I love the idea. I I don't want this Cole and Ivanova thing to happen. Be like, no, no, no. You don't get to do another love story until you complete the first one that you set up. I love the idea that our regular audience in the comments knows exactly when there will be a moment that Tara is going to see is the the proper next step and they've got like a, a secret ca- obviously we don't want to see it but they've got a Whatever secret countdown clock in that episode that would be the only thing we talk about during the review <laughs> <laughs> don't worry I, I will make sure that's not the case but uh, I appreciate Tara's dedication <laughs> Uh, two, two Tara Babylon 5 t-shirts are coming one is just bridge boy and the other one is they should have babies already <laughs> <laughs> I don't want no cold Ivanova babies before <laughs> you make me mad I mean those babies will have fantastic hair judging by the, the two parents yeah that is true but uh, there's something about Cole he's so like he's so drama club kid I don't like him. Not yet, anyway. All right, let's get, we'll get back to that, all right? We'll get back to that. We need to finish the main story first before we can talk about their scenes. Okay. So, but they get there. They get there around Jupiter, because that's obviously Ganymede's, you know, next to that. <laughs> it been, after all. Oh, yes. One of the Galilean moons. Hey, Tara's got knowledge. la di da <laughs> But I yeah. studied astronomy in school. I took like multiple classes. I, I, I thought I thought it was what I wanted to do, but turns out physics is hard. I did not, <laughs> but thank you, the expanse, for teaching me various moons <laughs> because I knew what Ganymede was when they mentioned it, and I, I felt all proud. I know what Ceres is. I know what uh, uh, what's the other one? Io. Like, mm-hmm. I, I know these, I, and obviously you got you got Titan and you got the other the Saturn ones, but still. This is fun. It's fun. Europa. That's another one. Mm-hmm. I've learned Callisto things. Callisto is the fourth one. Hey, there you go. Well, the fourth of the Galilean ones. There's like 17 moons or something around Jupiter. I can't remember how many. So it was a big planet, you know? That's what it is. Uh, so they get there. Immediately, they're kind of a little bit too late. It seems that they've sent in a human to merge with the ship because apparently it needs to have like a living being at the center of it to make it work, uh, which is not unlike the planet below Babylon 5, I would point out. I'm sure it's a little bit different, but definitely there's some similar philosophy. Get on there. 79 moons. What did you say, 17? You idiot. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> 79 satellites. That was surprising. That's a surprisingly high number. That's a lot. That's a lot of moons. I knew as soon as I said, I'm like, oh God, it's probably like 100. <laughs> do you know that favorite Star Wars line? That's no moon. No, it's 79 moons. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, the and basically Delenn immediately is like, "That's just that's just terrible. This isn't going to work because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like, and it's going to just be like an erratic ship that's just going to kill everything it sees. There's going to be no rhyme or reason. It's not going to be. No one's going to be controlling it. It's just going to be chaos. And sure enough, immediately this uh, ship starts firing upon its own station, like you know, the, the the you know the, the bases that are around it and stuff. Um, and. Right away, Shards, we have to fight this thing. We have to stop this before it gets to any populated areas. We have to stop this. So they fire upon it, uh, which succeeds in at least getting its attention. You know, to use a video game term, they get aggro. <laughs> you know, they aggro it. Uh, and Shards, and obviously, the tank. this was such a big deal. Now, they say that we may have a chance of killing this one because it's a like not properly controlled and it's just woke up and there are a bunch of reasons why it's a little bit vulnerable compared to the usual ones but there was such a it was such a hard task to kill the one that we've already killed which was you know by opening the jump gate and say the jump gate right all that shenanigans that it was like, okay how are you going to do this 
it's like what big stupid maneuver are you going to pull off and it ends up being well can this ship withstand the gravitational pull of jupiter <laughs> And can their ship withstand the gravitational pull of Jupiter? Because I've got a crazy idea. Uh, so I actually thought this was a fun sequence. Uh, mm-hmm. This you know, big over the top, uh, flying into Jupiter's atmosphere and going as far as they can before the ship's just going to be crushed, and then hoping that the shadow ship can't withstand it as much as they can. And which luckily turns out to be the case. But it, you know, they really—it's one of those things where it's like, oh, we have to turn back there; it won't be safe. And Sheridan, no, hold hold and then no <laughs> it's one of those moments there's a little bit of a star trek dig in here too where he's like uh he tells uh lanier to give her all she's got or something oh, okay yeah. and lanier is like i would tell you if i wasn't going like as much as i can or something <laughs> sure i never actually never actually occurred to me that was a star i can see why it is though you're right it probably yeah, is a star yeah. trek nod um but i i, I think so I, it's not I, the first time that's happened right even in this season no, that's true. Uh, I can't, it's, I think it's a fun nod. I don't think it's a salty nod. It's just kind of, no, 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 no. Because I, I, I actually love Linear's response. I'm like, I would tell you, if I, if I was holding power back, I would use it. <laughs> like, why would, why would I hold back? <laughs> and it's give funny her all because, she's got, Captain. Well, that should be your line, you're the Scott. I'll give her all she's got, Captain. Right. It's not good. It's because he's not really Scottish, that's why. <laughs> he's Canadian. <laughs> Actually, what? I should sound like him. <laughs> but yeah, what is it? R- Rowdy Roddy Piper as well was Canadian pretending to be Scottish. Why is it with Canadians pretending to be Scottish? It's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing the obvious one. What's Mike the Myers. obvious one? <laughs> Mike Myers. Ah, oh, that, 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 don't bring up. <laughs> His name is barred from this podcast. How dare you? apparently you scrubbed it from your brain <laughs> filthy bastard don't want no part of him filthy no of him. fat bastard shut your mouth the the only Mike Myers I want to talk about is a serial killer in Haddonfield Illinois thank you very much okay <laughs> that's the only one I want to yeah, talk about the one with palm trees in it right <laughs> Look, they had to shoot it in Pasadena. It's not their fault, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's so funny is watching that as not, not being an American is they didn't really... It, it's only because they pointed it in the palm commentary. Trees all over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm like, yeah, Illinois has got palm trees. Why not? <laughs> Hawaii, California, and Florida. I think those are... I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds right. Yeah, more Maybe tropical. Georgia beaches or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. But... Yes, Illinois, near Chicago, <laughs> has palm trees. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, yeah, big, big action moment. They kind of get away with it. But honestly, I mean, as exciting as this is, I think the more exciting part, because like I was saying, this episode is so much about everything with Earth and their stance and their secret mission coming to a head with the powers that be. The, this standoff that happens after the fact where an Earth ship, which turns out to be Sheridan's old ship, is a, you know just outside the atmosphere. The Agamemnon. Very good. I'm not impressed. I'm impressed you remember. That's a cool name. <laughs> That's a cool name. Uh, Some uh, a Greek king or something. I'll roll with king that. King of Argos. Sure. Why not? <laughs> so, and immediately, like, Sheridan's caught in this moment, though, because this is the thing, when I say it's coming to a head, like, he's caught in a choice here. It's like, and obviously, he, he thinks of a third option this time, but he's given two choices to begin with. He's given, well, either they're going to capture us, and he's like, no, we can't let that happen. We've got too much, you know, what we're doing is too important. It's like, or we're going to have to fight. He's like, no, I won't fire on my old ship. I'm not doing it. I'm not firing on an airship. He's still, he's still so tied to the idea that he is from Earth and he did fight for Earth Force, and that is still an important part of who he is. There's still, you know, there's still that pull there. Plus, so, it's a little bit like Picard firing on the Enterprise. Like, no. Sure, yeah, a little bit. You have um, a connection there. You know the people. Like, you're not going to do that. And it's also, I think, as well, is that he knows a lot of people on that ship, and he knows that they're not all. They all know the orders have been given. They don't know what's mm-hmm. going on. They don't necessarily know that they're doing something against... And they, they also don't know that he's personally on this ship. You know, this, this ship, the White Star, is a mystery. They don't even know what race this belongs to. So yeah. they don't know he's on there. You know, there's a lot of things like that. So 
it, but he's presented with this impossible choice and, and him like refusing and like Delenn saying no you have to make a choice that to me felt like like a, a warning that and at, you know the end of the episode where he sits down and says you know yeah we got out of this this time it, it made me feel like no he's going to have to make this choice again soon mm. And it's going to be a big deal, and it's going to feel like a prominent moment in the, the story. And it really felt like it was setting me up for it. And it was, and much like it, the soul is on this mission being important, and they, they might die. I think even more impressively than that, this sold me on this choice is going to catch up with him, and it's going to happen soon, and it's going to be a big deal. So, yeah, and plus, like the the Agamemnon, like knows they don't know what this ship is or who it belongs to. Um, but they know that it didn't use an opportunity to fire back or fight back. It just jumped away. That's true. <clears throat> well, it, it's possible that maybe people on that ship may even look at the... Because the news story that comes out afterwards is that they blame the White Star for this attack on Ganymede. They, they just assume... Yeah. I mean, obviously the people who were there know it wasn't. They know it was the Shadow Ship. Uh, or anyone who knows that the Shadow Ship was being woken up. You know, maybe it's maybe it's blurry. Maybe they don't know exactly what happened. Maybe it killed everyone who was there. But I assume there were survivors. Um... But they, they, they say the White Star's to blame. This mysterious new ship is another threat to Earth. This is another reason to, you know, as they do in the episode, uh, incur martial law. So you've got all this stuff going on. But you have to wonder, yeah, do, are people on that ship, are they looking down and going, they never fired back? You know, mm-hmm. they, they, if, if anything, they, they, they sent like a sort of fake surrender thing, said we're going to come out, uh, back up. After the fact, they might go they intentionally made us back up so that when they opened the jump gate and said the atmosphere which was potentially very dangerous they tried to make sure we were safe they, you know, yeah. they, they, that's effectively what they were doing that's why they sent that message um it was also partially so they could get to close to the edge of the atmosphere as possible to make it because uh, i actually i really like that details the, the less amount of hydrogen the better yeah because I, I like that detail when they were chasing the shadow ship or running away from it uh so, you know so someone said, oh, what was that? Like, uh, was that a new weapon that just hit us? And Sheridan's like, no, I'm pretty sure that's the weapons reacting with all the hydrogen that's inside this atmosphere. Yeah, I think, I think it was Lanier who said that, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I dug that because I don't know if I've ever seen a, like a, a space battle go into a gas giant before. So I kind of like them playing with that a little bit. Mm, I mean, I'm yeah. sure scientifically some of this was probably nonsense and that's okay. But in the context of, you know, having fun with it, uh, this was cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, so no, I love the standoff. I love what it means for Sheridan to have to make that choice, and the fact that it's still going to linger and it's still there in his head at the end. Like that, that I think that is to me is the the, the crown jewel of the episode. That is what the best part of this episode is. Is that? Yeah, I mean, he purposely he doesn't just take his badge off. Like before he goes on the mission, he gets in his civvies. Yeah, he's he's like, got, I'm not going representing the Earth Force at this point. Yeah, yeah, super cash. He's got, he's got now he's got to put on the on. costume of Earth Force when he goes on to Babylon 5. Yeah, and all this stuff, because, you know, the Night Watch actually starting to target him and, like, that being, like, the subplot also just mm-hmm. further compounds the fact that, no, something's going to have to change soon, one way or the other. Yeah, and really, maybe Sheridan shouldn't be going on these missions. Maybe he should be, like, trying to um, not be a bit more discreet. And, uh, you I mean, know, he's got Cole. Send yeah, him. Cole, Cole even says that he he, he expected he because because if Anova gets mad at him and says you know you you brought this up knowing that Sheridan wouldn't be able to resist and she feels bad that she's not there by his side as he's second in command to like help him, um which I thought was a good character beat for her. Um mm-hmm. obviously the episode starts with the comedy scene where they're at breakfast and they're complaining about the food, and you know someone brings Ivanova some bacon and eggs and disgusting. I, I hate I, I've always hated eggs so to me this is I, I appreciate the comedy here but I'm like this is disgusting the eggs are horrible how dare you but they, they're all like <laughs> also oh. I'm pretty sure Ivanova's Jewish I don't think she eats bacon <laughs> she, she can't I mean she comes from from a Jewish descent does, does she I mean I know she got kind of into it for the funeral stuff but yeah but is she like practicing is she actually actively you know, following all the rules. <laughs> I mean, it's an easy one to, to follow. Don't eat pork. I don't think she eats... I, I'm pretty sure they don't eat pig. They well, don't yeah. eat anything with like a hoof or something. But that, that's if she cares. Mm. She didn't seem to care when she said, I'll go deal with this after I've had breakfast and then started digging in. 
<laughs> Although I, I, I did really enjoy Garibaldi and Sheridan looking at it like just this jealousy of like we've not seen fresh bacon and eggs in years. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I get the same. There's even like a, an extra behind her who like looks over their shoulder <laughs> like <laughs> I smell it too. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's been it's been years since I smelled that. <laughs> Freaking officers always get the good stuff. Yeah, so it, it came from Cole. Uh, when she blows up at him later, though, he's uh, he's trying to explain like, "What? I thought he'd send me. Like, I didn't know he was going to go on his own, but maybe I should have seen that coming." And she basically complains that she doesn't understand like everything is changing. She doesn't understand the hierarchy because she, she, you know, it's kind of like what um Bridge Boy was saying last episode, right? Is that he trusts the system. He trusts the hierarchy. He trusts the chain of command. And she's yeah, that, that's very military. Yeah, and she's always been that character. So the idea that they're against, you know, Air Force now, where they're separate from it, and then you have someone like Cole, who is this like, okay, he's part of the group, but where does he rank? Is he above her? Is he below her? You know, that's kind of what she and uh, is, yeah. Do you take? Do I take orders from him? Like, is he? Uh, how much? How much of this information should he really know? Like, does he need to be privy to everything? Or yeah, it's a lot, like it's maybe a, keep some of the Earth Force stuff away from him. It's a lot of good questions. It's a lot of good questions from a character who cares yeah, about that. I think so too. I think it's something that probably should have been addressed earlier. Like she's right. Yeah. Like we should really establish this. And but instead, he's like talking about weasels in his pants or whatever. Well, that was the start of the scene when she was wasn't paying attention. So he was doing the thing where he just starts saying nonsense to. Yeah. Get her to. But I I totally understand her frustration. Hmm. Like you're you sort of invited yourself into this and everyone's accepted you but like i don't know why yeah oh to, to be first and clear sent him yes so i mean and she trusted him so and i do i'll say like the opening scene with him like fighting and stuff i thought was pretty good choreography like i like the fight scene it looked good oh, it sure. didn't look like it didn't look cheesy there's like, yeah. a lot of like cool someone like punching a slab of beef on the in the sound in the <laughs> microphone. You know, there's a lot of beef slapping <laughs> noises while he's hitting people with the <laughs> with the stick. I wonder. I'm just. I'm just wondering because obviously Tara's vegan, right? And I'm just wondering uh-huh. what the substitute is. They say all all foley artists go vegan, right? What do they use instead of beef to slap? What are they slapping for the sound effect? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Beyond I'm beef? sure there's some other thing. You Do you just use. contact the Beyond Meat people? Will it sound the same? <laughs> <They had it? laughs> I don't know. Just uh, some interns or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> we need some volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna slap you. <laughs> oh dear! But you're not allowed to scream or react in pain. We we just want the raw sound of the slap. <laughs> just the slap. <laughs> Unless it's a version of the Wilhelm scream. That's always allowed. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, so, but no, it ends up kind of a, a nice scene at the end where he comes over and he's, he's he's made like a chart of the hierarchy to try and make her feel better. But it's kind of a joke thing because his parents are on it and he's just kind of trying to make her laugh, uh, which it does. And it felt like a genuine moment, I, I think. Tara's not buying it. Um, no, it's... <laughs> It seems like it's written by somebody who doesn't know how to talk to women. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Like he's coming pulse. off very like a high school drama club kid, and I don't like it. That's all I'm okay. saying. I mean, maybe. I mean, we don't know for sure. This is definitely going to go down a romantic. That this could be a thing where she kind of makes it clear that this is not going to be romantic at some point, and he accepts that. That that could be where it goes. I mean, this show has surprised us many times with how it's handled things. Okay. You don't know for sure. That that could be the point of this story. This could be him being this almost cliched trying to woo her character and then different reaction. No? I would very much like that. I'm sure you would. We'll see how it develops. I, I think the purpose of the scene on its own, though, is that you get this moment of her laughing and sort of breaking down a little bit in, in a good way. And then she gets a call, turn on the news, and that's when we hear the martial law. And I think it's really effective for the contrast of, oh, we were able to forget for a second that everything's going really dark and it's really serious times. She loses that for a moment and you're kind of happy for her. And then she's brought screaming and kicking back down to reality uh, with the martial law announcement. So well, that was effective. Yeah. So Yeah, that was a surprising turn. 
because it yeah. comes off very defensive from the president's angle who is under fire for mm -hmm. you know for all, all these conspiracies being thrown at him about whether or not he was actually sick the day that the president was assassinated or if it's just propaganda against him but like it seems like a like a pretty bold move to just declare martial law because of paranoia that or like trying to spread the propaganda that well, um, I mean, no one can be trusted so everybody to be to be to be specific here though the the thing that gives them the ammunition to finally declare martial law is this attack on Ganymede which they're blaming this mysterious ship for which i think is important from the perspective of oh it's actually what our team what Sheridan Co did that actually mm -hmm. gave him the ammunition to sort of enact this i think there's a, an irony there that's important and something again that says that they have to change how this works they have to change the narrative uh, so I, I think that's yeah. important i mean much like what's happening with with the character of zach and being left out of the loop and people coming in with conspiracy theories it's very much like oh here's the bigger example of that because yeah. because everything is being kept hush hush then everyone's be everyone's able to plug in the conspiracy theories and they, and they line up too well for them not I, I to like um, take over. If I was to guess something that's going to come up soon is that however it comes about where they have to kind of like go public or reveal stuff or whatever, I'm expecting a big speech from Sheridan. I'm expecting mm -hmm. a big a broadcast broadcast speech. Yes, I'm expecting your. You're Captain America at the end of Winter Soldier. This is what we're really fighting for. And hell, that's even a good comparison because that the whole that whole thing's, you know, like half of us are Hydra. <laughs> like we have to mm -hmm. figure out which one of us are the good guys and which one of us are the bad guys kind of thing. Or, or even like a Picard style speech that's inspiring. Yeah, and, they're know. gonna need allies on Earth. They're gonna need a revolution. Which is already somewhat sparked because people are, you know, putting signs up saying like down with President Clark. Yeah, which makes sense, yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I, I do wonder, like, is there any characters who, like, does Bester somehow turn around and actually be more of an ally by the end of this? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, because right now we see Bester as more of, more of a villain, right? Who's working, like, you know, he's presumably all for whatever Psychor's doing and he's, like, at the top, tip top of that kind of hierarchy. But maybe we find out that maybe he doesn't know exactly where all these orders are coming from. And maybe he's... Maybe, like, we made that point uh, when we first saw Morden talking to Psychor and and the Earth Force people that that the that Bester wasn't there. It was some That's other Psychor guy. That's and you would think it would be Bester. Maybe Bester's not a part of, uh, you know, Bureau 13. That's what it was, yeah. I, hmm. I, I think we speculated that he just was not available that day <laughs> I mean, that's entirely possible that this could this could be best as like you know second in command who's there on his behalf on that day yeah i guess we don't have really any connections between the shadows and bester other than just psychor in general being involved yeah but like everything else they've infiltrated it's not everyone at every place so it's entirely possible that some psychor people are okay but i'm not i'm not going to yeah. bank on it but I suspect that Bester's still the villain. <laughs> I, I so do I. I'm, I'm just I'm wondering if like someone like that will end up being like again. So much of this show is like been very good at hinging on like us rooting and being at at times disappointed in characters' choices because it's a tragedy, and at times being fulfilled and relieved and like uh, mm -hmm. you know g given hope by a character's choice. And I just you know I I suspect there's going to be more of that, and it may not come from Bester. Like he may be the bad example to pick here, but you know. Uh, st still hoping for that one good Londo choice before the end. Just that one. Just that one heroic choice. I just want Zach. I mean, I think he's the immediate one. Sure. Yeah, Zach following. feels more eminent. Yeah, Zach feels more eminent. Yeah. Yes. Uh, unless they pull like a, a Whedon thing where they put him in the credits because he's going to have a big tragic death like really early this season. <laughs> just to shock <laughs> oh, us. Oh, that's right. <laughs> So he's in the credits now. He's in the credits now, which makes which gives you this false sense of security that he's at least safe for the whole season. You know? But we'll see we'll see uh good episode though um you know we, we long discussion some of it is going to get cut out and put in patreon because it was a big tangent about video games but <laughs> but it was still pretty long you know outside of that so good stuff yeah um i suspect the the next couple episodes as you said are probably going to be meaty also. i expect yes and we will metaphorically slap that beef tofu Tofu. We'll slap the tofu. 
It's actually a term which is a lot in wrestling. I mean, you have two big guys, like, slapping each other. You call that, you know, big meaty men slapping meat. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's our Babylon 5 discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that's our Babylon 5 discussion uh, for this episode. Uh, by all means, do let us know what you think of the episode in the comments. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some of our theorizing and discussion of characters and their choices and motivations. Uh I think just a uh, sentiment I'd like to end this on. I've just thought of that. I think the best thing about the show is caring about the choices the character is going to make. And I think that stands for almost any good storytelling. So that's why when there is a cheesy visual effect, it doesn't matter. Because I care too much about what's going on in the story to give a shit. Uh, so yeah, the effects is they're flying through Jupiter's clouds and stuff. Yeah, so it's a bit video game looking. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm into it, you know. So it doesn't matter. I'm so uh, yeah, I'm so past that at this point. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. You, you, you it was kinda... a discussion in season one, especially the gathering. But then it was a discussion yeah, for a few episodes, matter. and then your eyes just kind of adjusting. You're just you're used to it. It's just what it is now, mm -hmm. and it's fine. It does uh, look better. Yeah, it is a bit better as well. But you know, uh, there you go. That's uh, that's our th thoughts on the episode. So let us know what you think in the comments. Like and subscribe. Ding the bell for notifications. All those things do help out YouTube channels a lot. So please do hit those buttons. It's very easy and it does help out uh, the channel and everything. So do that. But you can also, of course, support us financially. Can they, Tara? That's right. Right? <laughs> if you enjoy these reviews, <laughs> please check out our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash TV. And if you donate $5 per month, you'll get access to these reviews one week early. So you get to talk to us a whole week early if you want. <laughs> I should, be nice. I should specify i mean you always say a week and it's you know it's close enough but it is specifically six days just 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 so that it's yeah i don't want to loss it is what almost I'm almost one week early yeah so so you, yeah so you it so, took a long time to correct me so so patrons you know they have fun tuesdays but they get that monday <laughs> where the, the public get the episode and mm. they can go so they get to watch it twice they get to, they have to watch it twice and they get to be like oh yeah been here like, done yeah this. and then you can see how the public <laughs> reacts to your patreon comments which are there six days early yes oh yeah you potentially can, you, six days early you can comment on the on the video yes uh when it's early um very good point yep. also check out our science fiction movie podcast we also have a, a movie channel called male fuzz movies where we have a show called the atomic cinema experiment and that is myself and tara reviewing a sci-fi movie every week and Obviously, the, the discussion varies from, you know, in-depth analysis when it's a film that's good and has, you know, stuff to analyze to, you know, shitting on a terrible movie and making fun of it when that's what the occasion calls for. Even and when it, there's a great actor in it. And everything in between. What are you thinking of? Are you thinking of Pandorum? I mean... Ben Foster's great. He's all right. He's all right. It's a bit of a stretch. That, that's... <laughs> If it was Garrett Graham, I'd understand. But Ben Foster, come on. <laughs> He's a standout. Mm. To easily top 10 actors working today. All right, there you go. That is that is a discussion. I've done the plugging. We're all good. Thank you once again for joining us. We always appreciate it. Keep watching Babylon 5. Just don't give away the home world. <laughs>